Hello everybody, and welcome to this audio recording. Today, I wish to tell you a series of short stories that I have created during the course of my college life. I have created these tales in hopes to show that I can tell stories in many different ways, not just through the world of drawings and panels, but words as well, for words play a significant role in the creation of great art. With the help of great friends and wonderful constructive criticism, I now have completed works that I shall share with you today. So with that, let me take you into the rural town of Tardiac, a town located in Bullamay State, and expose to you the many oddities, weirdness, tragedies, and horrors that fill the cracks of this strange town. I thoroughly hope that you enjoy your experience. Tale 1 Six Gunshots The Calabars are dead. The first gunshot was heard at Strongfist Manor at 1am on the 23rd of March, during the dead of night. The manor, which is at the top of the hill in the north part of Tardiac Bolome, was owned by a rich couple, named Mr. and Mrs. Calabar, who lived with their only child, named Brandon, who at around the time of the incident was about five years old. The story of their death spread all across Tardiac like wildfire, and rumors of the family's murder has been up in the air for months. It wasn't because they were well known, or that the family was particularly disliked by the town's people, but simply because the strangeness of their deaths leaves a lot of room for interpretation and bafflement. Theories that try and piece together the awful scene came up every couple of weeks, some say it was a violent burglary, others say it was inner conflict. There's even one theory that tries to argue that the family was killed in a fire that didn't spread far. However, despite the logic and practicality of them, none of those theories could explain the source of the sickly black slime that was all over the bodies when they were found hours later, nor does it explain the fate of Brandon's body, which was nowhere to be found. All these pieces, or lack thereof, create a scene that simply cannot be explained with pure logic or reason. It gives the incident of March 23rd far more bite than anything else from the town. Everybody loves a good mystery, and Tardiac was no different. Being a place that didn't get hit with crime all too often, an incident like this was like a source of entertainment to the people of the town. However, that could not be said for the Tardiac police and investigators like myself, who grew more and more frustrated with the town's growing interest in the fate of the Calabars. What annoyed us most was that the truth of this case was far more... complicated. For being a large manor owned by a wealthy family, there was, to our great relief, security cameras littered across the house. So... Thanks to surveillance footage and consent from remaining relatives, I, along with the Tardiac police, found out what actually happened to the Calabars on the night they were murdered. We were looking forward to finally putting the increasingly crazier theories to bed. At long last, Tardiac could stop talking about the Calabars' murder and coming to us with wild accusations and conspiracies. Then, the footage played. The footage was only two minutes long and is now out of my custody. But even then, what I saw on that tape shook me to my very core. Even now I find it hard to think that what I saw was real, and I believe that's what the other members of the investigation believed as well. After days of discussions and arguing, the story was set. The higher-ups told the town of Tardiac that it was in fact an accidental oil leak that killed the Calabars, to try and explain away the black slime and Brandon's missing body. The story states that because of the location of the black slime, it was safe to assume that Brandon's body was burned up from the fire, hence why it didn't spread any further than his two parents. This story was told about two months ago, four months after the death of the Calabars. It was a convincing story, minor props there if not for the fact that the Calabar's house had nothing that used oil. And it certainly doesn't explain the fate of Mrs. Calabar, who is now a mangled corpse. 
I understand why the police went along with the lie. Once the story was spread, talk of the Calabar's murder went down drastically. The number of townspeople that blindly believed it was a blow big enough to almost kill the town's interest, and thus the police could finally rest. But talk is still around. Not in the open, mind you, but in the dark corners of Tardiac. Some people heard our story, and saw right through it. It wasn't satisfying for them. They knew something was wrong. And now, the theories have grown from practical and logical to crazy and otherworldly. Theories that I am sad to say have the most weight behind them. I put myself on the line to tell you the truth. I was one of the few that argued that the real story should be out there when the higher-ups forged their fake tale, but many disagreed, and I was threatened with blacklisting if I was to run my mouth. I had a family to feed, hence why I stayed quiet. I know it sounds cowardly, but unfortunately, that's how the game usually plays out. The higher-ups have a history of forging and destroying evidence and punishing those who step out of line. I've seen this many times before, and I understand why. They do it so that the public doesn't panic, is to make sure that the people of Tardiac don't do anything rash. However, after many sleepless nights and levels of anxiety that surpass anything I felt before, I feel that it would be cruel to leave the town of Tardiac ignorant to what actually happened to the Colobars on the night of their murder. They must know. They must be ready. I fear what might happen to me, but the truth needs to be told, for I fear far more the consequences of staying silent about the Calabar's murder and the untold chaos that may unfold upon this town if it were to ever strike again. To those of open mind or innocent ignorance who read my account, I commend you. I wish that you at least give it some thought. To everyone else who reads this, I promise you that despite what weirdly twisted things you may hear from this account, I can tell you with utmost confidence that I would not sacrifice my life's work to simply tell you a tall tale. This is all real. I am not mad. At least, I wasn't. Let me tell you what the police department actually saw on that tape. The footage starts at 12.59pm, with the family all sitting together by the fireplace, a roaring golden fire leaving a warming glow throughout the room. The living room is quite extravagant. There's a scarlet rug next to a mahogany mantelpiece that surrounds the fireplace. There's a detailed painting of the Calabar family perched above the mantelpiece, showing the family to be one of hunters. Hence why on the back wall, there is a lot of stuffed heads of various different animals, like deer, bears, foxes, and even a giant moose. From looking at the footage, it's easy to know where the Calabars earned their money. In the footage, Brandon is staring at the fire. His mother is huddled up on a large fancy couch made of animal fur behind him, while his father is sitting on an expensive looking chair to the left of him, polishing what looks like to be a cult revolver, like the ones you would see in a cowboy movie. They were all sitting in silence as they enjoyed the warmth of the fire. All was going peacefully. There were three victims at the incident. All three victims inside Strongfist Manor right now are alive. The footage goes on uninterrupted for about ten straight seconds until the clock struck one, a loud clanging could be heard from outside, the source most likely being from the Tardiac Church. The bell clanged three times, and before it hit the fourth, Brandon turned to his mother, very suddenly. He looked like he was about to throw up, his face bearing an expression of horror and desperation. His head turned 180 degrees. The first gunshot sounded. Three bodies inside Strongfist Manor are alive. Mr. Calabar missed his target. The peaceful scene of the loving family that surrounded the fireplace turned into a scene of chaos in the blink of an eye. 
Mr. Calabar shot the gun out of shock from his wife's sudden shriek of terror. He hadn't even noticed his son's head turning more and more like an owl until Brandon was staring right at him. Brandon's body began to change, his mass under his clothes bulging and ripping at the seams. He started growing larger and larger and larger, to a point where he was the size of a strong grizzly bear. Brandon became what I can only describe to be an abomination, a disgusting freak of nature that has never been seen on this planet. It was like some cosmic force managed to possess the young boy and turn him into an eldritch horror that has since scarred my eyes every time I attempt to sleep. His two legs became eight that were long and jointed like a spider, each leg stabbing itself into the wooden floor, leaving a heavy crater from the weight. His two human legs hung uselessly, dangling from an abdomen that looked like a diseased rat with no hair, the skin folding in upon itself in layers, covered only in small patches of brown fur. Then the boils came. Disgusting black boils the size of footballs that started to grow out of Brandon's back, sides, and stomach. Boils that filled rapidly and popped under the pressure, splattering a disgusting, inky black fluid all over the rug and the floor. Every time a boil popped, another one grew to take its place. He was partially bathing in a pool of his own fluid. His head was something else entirely. It became a thing that not even the deepest or most horrific nightmares of the human mind could conjure up. His eyes began growing and shrinking every second all over his face, the eyes becoming white and blank like a blinded dog. Spider-like pincers now replaced his cracking and breaking lower jaw, which fell to the ground with a crunch as it was crushed by one of his legs. The mousy blonde hair that was on his head had now fallen off, leaving a bald patch that was now filled with smaller but distinguishable white eyes that looked in all directions. Brandon's transformation was complete. Many people who watched the footage at this point screamed and ran out of the room, while others kept staring at the screen, primal fear paralyzing them to their seats. Unfortunately, I was one of the few that stayed. I cursed my body for not running away, when there was still some sanity left in my mind. As Mrs. Calabar let out a blood-curdling cry, Brandon launched at her almost as sudden as his transformation, his movement extremely sporadic and quick despite his massive size. His two front legs did the work of grabbing his mother, and with a swift motion, he opened up his pincers and began stabbing down at her neck. It was clear that Brandon wasn't in control, for under the sounds of his mother's upper body cracking and the goring of her flesh, a faint sound of crying could be heard from him. A very loud but obvious crack could be heard from the footage as Brandon stabbed his pincers deep into his mother's neck, Mrs. Calabar's screams of agony being muffled from the gargling of the blood that started building up in her mouth. The second gunshot sounded. Two bodies inside Strongfist Manor are alive. One is dead. Mr. Cullabar managed to hit the side of Brandon's body, popping a large boil as its contents splashed onto the floor. Maybe it was the suddenness of the killing. Maybe it was the initial scream of his wife. Either way, Mr. Cullabar was clearly in a state of shock and astronomical fear. To have all that he once knew go up in flames in the span of five seconds must have messed with his aiming. Brandon still held the body of his mother in his two front legs and turned slowly from her onto his father. Mr. Cullabar screamed as he saw the remains of his wife and launched himself backwards, accidentally falling back onto the chair. The force of the fall caused the chair to topple backwards, hitting the ground with a crash as it smashed to pieces. Brandon stood very still, still clutching onto his mother's body. He held it close as he pressed his deformed face into her chest, the cries now being heard more clearly. The noise did not match his form. Instead of something otherworldly or alien, it was the cries of a scared child, 
as tears began to form in his many eyes and meld in with the blood of the gory body of his mother. He held her tight, as two more of his legs wrapped around her waist, allowing Brandon to hug her in a sickly embrace. He stayed there for a few seconds, crying audibly as Mr. Cullabar got back up from his fall. Brandon noticed this and quickly began to move over to him, his legs moving in a hypnotizingly rhythmic formation away from the camera. His front legs were outstretched to his father, showing his mother's body. He was trying to speak, but the pincers made the words sound alien, as if Brandon was speaking in an entirely different language. But it seemed like the adrenaline finally kicked in. Being a very skilled hunter, primal nature took over. Mr. Cullabar pointed his gun at Brandon, and pulled the trigger. The third gunshot sounded. Two bodies inside Strongfist Manor are still alive. One is dead. A direct hit. He got Brandon right in one of his pincers as it fell off with a sickly crunch, splattering the floor and Mr. Cullabar with the black slime. I knew it must have been a good shot from the footage, because almost immediately afterwards, Brandon let go of his mother and retreated a few steps back, letting out a shriek. Dear God, that shriek. The noise caused many more members of the investigation to leave the room with either fear or nausea, and it is a sound that will orchestrate my nightmares for the rest of my life. It was slightly gurgled from the blown-off pincer, but despite the monster I saw in the footage, I knew what that sound was all too well. It was a shriek of pain. A shriek of agony. The noise you would hear when a child would fall and scrape its knee. It was terrifying thanks to the volume, but at the same time, it sounded innocent. As a father myself, I could almost sympathize with what I heard. Brandon tried to step forward towards his father again, black ink dripping out from his newly fresh wound. He was holding his two legs out to grab his mother, trying to get to her again. He had his back turned to the camera, so whatever expression Brandon made that Mr. Cullabar saw after he shot him is anyone's guess. However, that did not stop Mr. Cullabar from letting out a scream of horror, stepping over his wife's body and pointing his gun straight at Brandon's head. The fourth and fifth gunshots sounded in rapid succession. One body inside Strongfist Manor is still alive. Two bodies are dead. The entire ordeal lasted for only 90 seconds, yet watching it felt much longer. Never in my life did I expect that I would see such horrors come from what looked like a perfectly loving family. My senses felt assaulted. My mind felt overwhelmed. It felt as if a fabric of reality I once knew was ripped and torn away, placing me in a hole that only the horrors of deep space could fill. More members walked out of the room, and soon, there was only a few of us left. As the now lifeless body of Brandon lay on the floor, black slime oozing out of the four fresh gunshot wounds, Mr. Cullabar was now the last one standing. He stood over his wife's body and stared at Brandon, the revolver still in his now shaking hand. He stayed like this for a few seconds. And then, his head began to bow, and he looked to the ground, looking at his wife's mangled corpse between his legs, not putting down his gun hand for even a second. As he looked at her, he suddenly began to violently shake, like someone having a very serious anxiety attack. The gun began shaking as well, as Mr. Cullabar looked to be almost vibrating as the shaking got stronger. Then... His shaking stopped. Mr. Cullabar then contorted his body, arched his back, threw his head into the air, and laughed. The laugh was what caused a few more people to leave the room, leaving only two people left, myself included. 
I do not blame anyone who left at that moment. The laugh was as horrid as Brandon's cries of pain. On one hand, you could tell he was mourning the loss of his wife and his son. The laugh had a horribly guilty sound to it as it pounded against the walls of the living room. You could hear the pain and sadness in his voice as he roared his vocal cords dry. The noise, however, was not what got to me. It was his expression. It showed the complete opposite. Rather than a look of great pain or sadness, it had a smile that was unnaturally wide, with eyes that popped out of their sockets, his mouth opening to a puppet-like appearance so that the camera was able to pick up the back of his mouth. Mr. Culabar's face told what was really happening to him. It was gleeful. It was reveling. The man that was Mr. Culabar was long gone from this world. His remaining sanity had completely snapped, like a thin twig. And all that was left was a howling, bellowing husk of a once great hunter, husband, and father. Amid this horrid orchestra of demonic howling, Mr. Culabar steadied his gun hand and placed it to the side of his head, laughing as the hammer pulled back and clicked. The sixth gunshot sounded. Three bodies inside Strongfist Manor are dead. The Culabars are no more. The final person left the room to vomit, and I was the only one left to watch the footage. I couldn't move from my seat. I sat there transfixed as my eyes refused to even blink. I stared at the footage making no sound as I saw Mr. Culabar's body fall to the ground with a splat as the remains of his head hit the floor. Then the footage stopped, and the tape was ejected from the cartridge. It took me a good few minutes to try and move, for I didn't even think I could. I felt extremely dizzy, like I was spun very quickly and suddenly stopped. I started feeling weightless too, as if I jumped off a cliff and was yet to hit the ground below. My mind was in a whole other place, while my body sat there frozen in my seat, going numb from what I'd just witnessed. But above all that, a feeling of earth-shattering fear hit my mind. It was like I'd just witnessed doomsday and knew that there was nothing I could do to stop it, that all I could do was just sit there and watch as the world burned around me, plaguing the world with creatures unlike any we've seen or known before. I imagined the world in a holocaust of madness and terror, a future where mankind would throw themselves into the pits of hell and never return to normality again, a world of suffering and survival all under a sickly dark sky and a ground drenched in blood and ink where the horrid creatures would come. I saw all of this as I tried to piece together everything I saw from that tape, and unfortunately... It was at this moment where I think something inside me snapped. Maybe I'm just crazy. Maybe everything I've said was just the ramblings of a madman. Maybe it was best not to say anything. No. It can't be. I wouldn't risk everything just to lie. I knew that what I saw was real. It must have been. It had to have been. How else could I tell Tardiac that after everything, there is a small chance that Brandon could still be alive? Because right before the tape stopped, I could have sworn that I saw Brandon move. Tale 2 The Painter Michael Donovan is in prison. At long last, his terrifying reign over the town of Tardiac has been stopped and contained. Over the past two months of searching, DNA sampling, and multiple investigations into different families, 
15 people are confirmed dead. And that's only counting the bodies we found so far. It is with the hatred of a thousand sons that I say that those 15 bodies, some of which were young men and women, are not all the people who died by Michael's hands. That is, if the paintings Michael produced during his crusade are anything to go by. The paintings in question were found in Tardiac's art gallery, located close to the local church on the 3rd of July. Michael's work, which contained a portfolio of many finished paintings created using oils, became a local sensation overnight. The contents of his work left the townspeople speechless and ecstatic. People from all around Tardiac came to see the young artist's work, and marveled at the detail and accuracy of the proportions and expressions in each piece. A common thing that was always pointed out was how the red of his paintings had a very lively feel to them, while the older paintings red had this weird age to them. The models Michael used as reference were of people between the ages of 20 and 60, some happy couples while others sat alone. There's even one painting that shows a man who looks to be in his 70s lying asleep in a hospital bed, a painting that Michael boasted to be the one that started his new wave of paintings. There was this scarily beautiful attention to detail that could be found in Michael's art, all of which were drastically different to one another. Even as I look at them now, I would be lying through my teeth if I said a part of me wasn't slightly impressed with his work. The town wasn't lying. Michael Donovan had grown to have a very impressive talent of life painting. Because of one specific thing that made his work stand out from the others. In addition to the drastic age range of the models, they were all posed in the most puzzling of ways. These poses ranged from expressive sitting, exaggerated shows of affection, to others that looked like a dance routine. What was even more bizarre was that the more expressive and vibrant paintings were modeled by the older people, people who under any normal circumstances would not have the power nor the flexibility to pull off such positions, especially for a long time, which Michael claimed to be the case for all of them. All of this combined made Michael's work striking and, above all, famous, with critics from all over the world coming to the gallery to try and piece together the mystery behind such magnificently strange paintings. They would sometimes stare at them in awe for hours on end, according to the locals. From the way they looked at them, they said the critics almost looked hypnotized by the illustrations. When questioned about his methods, Michael would always give the same answer. He just found people who were excellent models. Models capable of staying completely still for hours on end, never moving a muscle. He claims that he simply got lucky with his reference material. <sighs> Hindsight is sometimes a very dark and vile thing. Looking back, I find his use of the word lucky in his statement to be disgustingly sly. The psychopath was confessing the whole time, and it went under everyone's nose. No one was the wiser. <sighs> it makes me want to puke. It was sheer luck that got Michael caught. On the 6th of April, three days after his grand opening into the world of stardom, a young girl from the south of Tardiac rushed into the gallery. Accounts from the locals in the building at this time say that the girl was clearly distraught, as if she was either on the run or was lost. But when she saw one of his paintings, a piece illustrating an old woman doing the splits, the young girl began screaming and wailing in horror, claiming that the identity of the person who modeled for that painting was her grandmother, who, over the distressed cries of anguish, she found dead in that exact same pose. Locals concerned for the child's mental health called for an ambulance, and after no response from them, the police, who arrived at the gallery a few minutes later to take the child home. 
The girl at this point was in hysterics. She wrestled, scratched, and bit anyone who came close, and after a bit of struggle, was drugged and put to sleep. One local, a man in his mid-thirties, claimed to know the father of the young girl. They were a poor family from the south of Tardiac, named the Arakos. Police, after getting directions from the local, took the child back to her home, and were concerned to find a lack of response when they knocked on the door, and when they tried to open it, found it to be locked. After breaking it down and making their way inside, the Tardiac police were met with a scene that caused many of them to scream or be sick with horror. Inside the house of the Anarchos, they found the decomposing bodies of the young girl's parents and the body of her grandmother, the most rotted of the three, still doing the splits. Investigations began immediately. Unfortunately for Michael, his inspiring attention to detail was what got him caught, for it only made it easier for the police to find his victims by using his paintings as reference. The evidence against the deranged artist only got higher and higher as more and more bodies were found. The young girl has since found a new home in the north side of Tardiac. God bless her soul. And Michael has been sentenced to life in prison, and there he shall rot for the rest of his days, while his paintings are to be used as evidence against him and forever leave an ugly scar on the town's history, his adoring critics' reputations, and the history of art itself. This investigation leaves in me nothing but a burning hatred that even to this day continues to make my blood boil whenever I think about it. I find it detestable that someone born of this earth could be capable of something so disgustingly evil, and I despise even further the demonic lanes bastards like Michael would go for the sake of their sickly craft. What makes my being bubble with this hatred the most, however, is that despite Michael's horrid acts of inhumanity and the disgusting blight he's left on Tardiac, it is with gritted teeth that I say that Michael, even through all of his insane descendants into murderous madness, knew exactly what he was doing. Here is a theory on Michael's goal that I present to you after reading through all of the documentations I have so far, and through analyzing his work in painful detail. Do take all of this with a pinch of salt, of course, if you think I'm wrong. Michael Donovan was a 24-year-old artist who barely graduated out of Tardiac College with a degree in fine arts and illustration. His work in college was wholly unremarkable. His art had this sense of amateurish ignorance, like he was never fully paying attention to the model he was illustrating. His skills clearly had a lot of room for improvement. From an outsider looking in, his art blended with all the other bland and uninspired artists who attended and graduated the college. Tarniak was not really known for its artistry. He was, in short, another aspiring artist destined to fall into a life of poorness and misery. An artistic, but basic, Nobody. However, his lack of exceptional skill didn't stop him from trying to get his name out there, as he would try to sell his work to the local gallery after creating new paintings for the occasion. I know this information, thanks to interviewing the gallery's owner myself. I was told by the director of the gallery that he knew of Michael long before the infamous paintings, and he recalled with nostalgia the times Michael tried to submit his art every year, but failed due to his painting's poor quality. Being a young and inspiring artist, Michael always blamed his models for the lack of artistry he showed in his work, claiming that it was impossible to paint someone who always kept moving. If they just stayed still, Michael has been quoted as saying that he would have the ability to paint alongside the likes of Leonardo, Raphael, Michelangelo, and other legendary artists from the great renaissance of long ago. 
Back then, those were merely the words of an artist who couldn't take rejection. After doing some digging into the timeline of his paintings and taking him at his word, I analyzed the painting of the old man that sparked this wave of terror. From the painting and the accounts of the nurses and doctors from the hospital on the day this painting was made, I found out that this sleeping old man Michael painted was in fact his grandfather. And on top of that, in the painting he was not sleeping, but was already dead at the time Michael began his work. He passed away on the 23rd of March. The nurses and doctors thought nothing of it when they found the artist painting his dead relative. After all, different people show different ways to honor their lost loved ones. On the contrary, they found the artist painting to be strangely charming, even endearing. Here is where my theory comes into this history. I think that on that day, a horrible monster that was inside Michael for many years finally raised its ugly head. The artist's claims of held back quality from the fault of his models turned out to be true. As he sat there mourning his loss, he must have noticed the stillness of his grandfather's lifeless body, and it caught his attention so much that he decided to paint him. Because his grandfather couldn't move an inch, for he was of course dead, Michael was finally able to focus on the minute details, without the worry of his model moving, festering in the back of his head. The monster finally had a chance to shine, and took the jump. The young man was willing to give it his all into this twisted experiment. And on that dreadful day, the aspiring artist created his first ever masterpiece, an exact replica of his grandfather, proving that once and for all, he was right. Thanks to his dead grandfather, Michael's talent shone through like a beacon through the blackness of space, and with life no longer holding him back, he finally reached the summit of his potential. After all those years of setbacks, he finally struck gold. I imagine the feeling of completing this masterful drawing must have been one that words couldn't possibly even begin to describe. What I think happened was that after this painting was finished, the gears in Michael's brain began to turn, and through each spin of the cogs of his mind, a plan began to form. A plan that once put into action would send Michael crawling down the path of infamy and towards the beginning of his bone-chilling career of life-ending art. Michael was ready to get his hands dirty with another soul's life. The plan was extremely efficient. Michael was very careful in how he carried out his crimes, making sure to leave as little evidence of himself behind. Because of this lack of evidence, I can only use the paintings and my own logic as guidance to piece together how his victims were killed. But even though his plan was very well thought out, it still had holes. Glaring holes. And these holes are enough to help me see the process of a Michael Donovan styled painting. From looking at the canvases closely, I noticed a couple of patterns. For one, the necks of the models had deep bruising, with some of the faces having red spots indicating punches or blows, done with either hands or some kind of blunt object. Michael either beat or strangled his victims to death, sometimes both. The red in the oils in the paintings, to my emotionally stunted numbness, was made using the blood of his victims, thus explaining why the older paintings had a more muted and even browned look. But the biggest and most subtle pattern was that all the victims came from poor families or backgrounds, 
the south of Tardiac, judging by the bodies we found so far. This very easily explains why Michael's killings were never found, for the south of Tardiac made hiding the evidence easy. Here's the thing you need to know about the south. It's pretty much the town of the poor. South Tardiac is filled with poor young couples and old hermits, people who don't have much family history. This explains why no one came forward when the people in South Tardiac were getting killed off. In that town, the victims had little or no connections to anyone. Barely anyone even knew that they existed in the first place. The foul stenches of the poorly handled streets and open sewers made it so that Michael was able to just leave the houses without having to dispose of the bodies, as the dead stench would blend in with the other foul smells in Tardiac, making suspicion close to non-existent. As for the Aracosa's murder, here's what I think happened. My theory is that Michael killed the grandmother first, and while he was painting her over the course of a few days, Mr. and Mrs. Arako came home and caught him in the act. Despite being outnumbered two to one, Michael managed to overpower them and was able to kill them quickly. He managed to flee the scene shortly before the young girl came back home, where she discovered the crime scene and headed for North Tardiac through an open window around the back, hence why the front door was locked. When I phrase it like that, it's a fucking miracle that the girl wasn't there with her parents. If she was killed, who knows how many more people would have died from Michael's reign. As for the model's weird poses, that is the easiest part of this case to explain. The body simply underwent a biological phenomenon called rigor mortis. It's a natural condition that causes the muscles of an organism to freeze in place a few hours after it dies, the time of freezing depending on the ambient temperature of the organism's surroundings. Because Tardiac is known for its cold weather, especially in the south, rigor mortis must have been fairly quick. When it activates, the dead organism can maintain a position from between a couple of hours to a couple of days, and once the muscles freeze, they are as stiff as a board. I have experience with rigor mortis when I had to bury one of my dead pets. But that's not the point. Michael must have learned this after a couple of kills, and used it to his advantage when he started painting more strange and extraordinary illustrations. Thanks to this natural phenomenon, Michael was able to pose his models like fleshy action figures, and once rigor mortis kicked in, his models would hold extravagant poses for several hours while staying completely still, and Michael would get to work creating another masterpiece. And Michael would do this again, and again, and again. This is all just a theory. Of course, there is a chance that Michael is simply just a deranged psychopath with no deep or defined motivation. A psychotic hellspawn who simply killed his victims and painted them just for a quick sense of sadistic euphoria. In a way, I honestly wish that turns out to be the case. However, through looking into Michael's life and gazing at his works of art until sometimes long hours into the night, I feel like my theory contains a good portion of weight, and thus, it's a little too close to home. It's a little too many targets to be considered false. Coming up with these theories behind killers is what makes an investigator's job important. It helps the world at large to see and prevent future psychos from emerging among us. In a way, it makes us feel a sense of great intelligence, even genius. The big disadvantage to this, however, is that in doing so, we sometimes humanize demons that under any other circumstance would simply be shunned away as the bloodthirsty monsters that they really are. What really was Michael's motive? 
Was he really just that desperate to create something wonderful? Was it, in a sick way, just dedication to the craft that kept him going further and further down the rabbit hole, leaving a trail of bodies behind? Was he really as evil as my heart wants to make him out as being? Or was he simply just an artist, who out of a sense of desperate want to stand out in a world where nothing is original, creates something different? I will never get answers to these questions. And as much as it would make an interesting psychology lesson, I do not care. I find it tiring to try and understand evil. All I know is that there is a lot more work for us to do. If all the paintings were made using real-life models as references, Michael Donovan has killed over 50 people. As I speak, South Tardiac still contains the remains of the rest of his victims. There they will be waiting for us to find them, decomposing and rotting inside an abandoned decaying house, with no one to miss or grieve their passing. They shall be found as just another number to be added to a horrifyingly high body count. It makes me sick knowing that Michael's reign over Tardiac still has grip on this town. Talks of his work still lingers around with the locals, and teenagers from the south have made a sick game out of hiding different body parts of the victims so that their remains, and in turn the victims' identities, would be harder to track down. It just confuses me, more than anything. Tardiac never used to be like this. Not during the time I was raised here, anyway. Tardiac just used to be quiet. It was a very unremarkable town. But now, there's this weird attraction to the demonic and the cruel that has grown across Tardiac and has started to infect the townspeople. I've never heard so many stories of people going missing, people getting killed, or people becoming something else entirely in my whole life. It's honestly crazy seeing them devolve like this. It feels like there's some kind of great evil that has latched its deadly talons around the heart of this town, corrupting it from the inside out. The crime rates have been higher than they ever were before, with some cases being so wild that it made the investigators and the Tardiac police go mad from fear of something they couldn't understand, nor explain. When I say that, the Colobar case comes to mind. And now, I have my own monstrous tale to tell. Michael's methods of killing his victims have made even the strongest of men inside the police department of Tardiac cringe in horror, and caused many people who led the investigation to leave out of sheer disgust, dread, or loathing. There's very few of us left, but someone's got to take care of it. I, for one, am glad that we managed to catch him. The monster is at long last in prison, where the only thing he may paint is the walls of his cell with what I don't want to imagine. All I hope is that the scum inside with him give him the hell he rightfully deserves, that his stay in Tardiac prison will be slow, harsh, agonizing, and merciless. May your death be excruciating, Michael Donovan, and once you perish from this earth, May your soul burn in the fiery gulfs of hell, where it shall be tortured for all eternity. May the devil use your soul as a blank canvas. Tale 3 The Cleaner I came to Tardiac Prison in hopes to help one of the inmates recover from his time spent inside the walls of his cell. The criminal, whose name I will not say for it is irrelevant to this account, was at this prison serving a two-year sentence for illegal ownership of cannabis. 
a very mild crime in comparison to the other ones that have been committed in Tardiac during these past few months, but a crime nonetheless. He was taken out a few weeks after he was put there, for reasons not clearly given to his fellow inmates as he was taken out during the dead of night. But that didn't stop the inmates from talking, however. Because despite them not seeing a thing on the night this new cellmate was moved out of this prison, they all heard the screams and screeches of mind-shattering fear coming from his cell on the 27th of June. From the screams, stories started running the rounds. I had a couple of friends over in the Tardiac Police Department, and through drinks and general socializing, they told me of these many stories that have been going around inside the walls of Tardiac Prison, all of them trying to answer the fate of my patient's passing. The stories were, in all honesty, far more entertaining. They told scenes of great struggle and intense violence, with some even saying he was killed on the night of his departure, hence the screams of bloody murder that went silent very suddenly. However, all of these stories had one thing in common. Whether he was just in the background or was the actual perpetrator, the stories all had his cellmate involved, who they, along with the police nicknamed, The Cleaner. Of course, the real explanation is far less grandiose. My patient in reality just fainted from intense stress levels. Nothing bad actually happened to him during his time in Tardiac prison besides a few beatings and rivalries. But instead of telling them the truth, the police find these stories to be a good way to keep the inmates in line, out of a great sense of uneasiness, even fear for my patient's old cellmate. Hearing all of this from the outside made for some mildly amusing entertainment, but the one thing that really started getting interesting for me was just all this talk surrounding The Cleaner, a character that I grew to realize had a bigger impact inside the prison than I originally thought. When my friends talked of him, there was this weird sense of confusion in their voices, a confusion on how they should tell their stories of The Cleaner's antics in prison. While the inmates tell the cleaner being one of, if not the most dangerous person to ever go inside Tardiac Prison's walls, despite not really doing anything, which I later found out. Needless to say, all of this made me very intrigued. As a therapist, I found myself becoming enamored with this cleaner character, and wanted to know more about him. Luckily, I had all the connections a curious man could ask for. I suppose being friends with the police comes with a couple of bonuses. So I started there, in hopes to get the story on how he managed to land a room in this town's prison. What I didn't expect to find out on this quest for knowledge was the reluctance of the police to actually tell me anything about his case. Whenever I tried to bring him up, they would always sway the conversation to either a different subject or give basic responses such as, killed a bunch of people, or he's insane, and leave the conversation at that. It was like pulling teeth with them, which I found odd considering that many of them were fairly tough individuals, people who've seen their fair share of graphic and gory crime scenes. From the way their attitude shifted at the mention of his name, you'd think that they were afraid of being heard or watched by the strange man. Suffice to say, their refusal to tell me anything about the cleaner only fueled my love for the mystery even more. In hindsight, I was a rather annoying fellow. My pushing would sometimes get so bad that some of my friends risked kicking my teeth in. One even threatened dropping our friendship if I kept blathering on about him before throwing his drink in my face and leaving the bar. I was very offended back then, after all, I thought that talking about a case like this would be easier as they could get it off their chest. They for once had a person who was willing to hear what happened. But I see the error of my ways now. I understand why they were so insistent on telling me nothing. After all the information I managed to gather through my other connections. All the Tardiac police refused to tell me the story, except for one man, Barry Hanniger. He was one of the new recruits that was hired only a few months ago, and thus he wasn't involved in the cleaner's case. 
But that didn't stop Barry from trying to help me. <laughs> oh god, no. The only thing you must know about Barry is that he is a model police officer. A large and firm, but very likable and easygoing fellow. He was very interested in the cleaner case, much like myself, and promised me that he would have the story in no time. His natural well-mannered character, sharp wit, and continuous charm must have worked wonders in getting information from his higher-ups, and throughout the course of a few days, he phoned me up and informed me that he got everything he could, even further connections if I was interested. I didn't notice it back then due to my raging excitement, but I now remember Barry's change in tone when he gave me that call. He sounded almost... terrified. The next day, Barry and I met up for a coffee in a small cafe close to the station, and immediately I told him to inform me of his findings. Barry said he would, but was very hesitant at first. He first asked me if I had a strong stomach. Being a therapist who has heard all kinds of messed up stories from patients and police alike, I instinctively said yes. He paused for a moment, still being cautious, and told me that he would tell me about the cleaner, but only under the promise that I would never tell a soul. I nodded instantly, my excitement barely contained inside my body. With a long exhale and a deep breath, Barry began his story. My excitement over the course of this tale would slowly turn into deep, deep horror. The cleaner's actual name is Felix Baldiar. He is a 35-year-old Caucasian man born in South Tardiac, meaning he grew up in a poor family and was raised in a harsh environment. Little is actually known about his childhood, for most of the family moved away a few years ago, or were dead, and the police didn't want to get the remainder of them involved. According to the police, his first victim was on the 23rd of March, a date I recalled being the same as another case in Tardiac, but I forget the incident exactly. Alas, that isn't the point. At approximately 10pm, Tardiac police got a strange phone call from the first victim's neighbor, whose name I will not say. The call was very difficult to handle and decipher, as the neighbor was in a state of complete insanity. Nothing the poor woman said made any sense. She just kept repeating and screaming the same few words over and over and over again. Clean. Body. Clean. Folded. Clean. Thinking that the old woman was going through a psychotic or mental episode, the police managed to track down the phone's origin and arrived shortly at her house, which was located in Tardiac's northeast region. It took many minutes to calm the woman down, who just kept repeating those few words, but in a much quieter and frightened voice. But they did eventually manage to get some information out of her. Once she had some people looking after her, a few members of the police decided to head to the house the woman claimed to be the source of her meltdown. It was locked from the outside, and once they broke in, the scene immediately unfolded upon them. Barry hesitated a bit here, and after my encouragement to keep going, he told me of the scene that left many of the officers scarred, many others horribly freaked out, and the scene that caused some of them to even quit their jobs. On the floor of the rather extravagant living room, they found the remains of the body. The body was separated and split into bone, muscle, and skin all folded neatly, like a set of clothes. What made the scene even more strange was that the living room, along with the entire house, was completely clean of blood, along with any fluids at all. It was like the house was deep cleaned from the inside out. It took a while for the investigation to get going, for the higher-ups didn't believe the officers at first when they went back and reported their findings. They thought that all of them must have gone crazy, like the cases over the past few months were starting to dwell on their psyche, and that this crime scene caused many of them to snap. Fortunately for the officers, 
Photographs and consistent accounts from present members were plentiful enough for one of the higher-ups to check the scene himself. Needless to say, he gave the okay to the investigation a few minutes after seeing everything. The cleaner became a name everyone at the station knew. His methods sent many of them on strange paths towards conspiracies, while others claimed it was all a hoax. Both sides had their convincing arguments, for how was it possible to have a body separated like that, and yet have no traces of the victim's identities left behind? They couldn't check for fingerprints or fingernails. The tips of the fingers and toes were scrubbed and bleached, and the nails were removed. They couldn't check the victim's clothing. The clothes were washed. They couldn't check for hair. The body was shaved from the scalp to even the eyelids. They couldn't check for fluids. The body was bone dry. They couldn't even check for teeth samples, for the body had none to show. What made this case even more unsettling was that outside sources were also sanitized out of existence. This included photographs, passports, documents, even family heirlooms. The victim's identity was cleaned out of the records, as if they were never even there. To begin with. It seemed that the cleaner, excuse my use of the word, had scrubbed his traces completely clean. It was impossible to find any leads on the killer. Even the objects inside the house contained nothing. It was like the cleaner was a ghost. A being that didn't even exist. For the next couple of months, more scenes like this popped up all around Tardiac, and all of them repeated the same pattern. The body would be found split into bone, muscle, and skin, with all fluids drained and collected, fingers and toes scrubbed away, teeth missing, body shaved from head to toe, and the clothes would be, of course, cleaned. Like the house before it, the crime scenes would be devoid of any mess and any evidence, and were always spick and span when the police arrived. The other pattern they noticed, Barry told me, was the fact that all of the cleaner's victims were very old, and had no connections to anybody. They were all alone on the night of their death. The police were all very disturbed by this. They hated how the houses looked so perfect when they walked in, only to have three piles of inhumanity lying in wait for them. They hated that no matter how hard they looked, they couldn't find a single shred of a trace that could lead them in any possible direction. From the clean house to the lack of evidence, it was almost like the cleaner was mocking them. Desperate to get any leads at all, the police eventually got Tardiac Hospital involved, hoping that the nurses and doctors could help them find any evidence to track the cleaner down. For the first couple of weeks, nobody got anything. Everybody just led to another dead end. The ghost that was the cleaner continued lingering and killing around Tardiac, leaving nothing but a nightmarishly sanitized hell scene behind. It seemed like all hope to catch this raving psychopath was lost. That was, until eight months later... A miracle happened. A young nurse from the hospital was examining the remains of one of the victim's bodies at very early hours in the morning, the victim being an old man. While she was examining the body, she noticed a small bulge inside the victim's lower jaw. After reporting her findings to the higher-ups, the hospital decided to perform an autopsy to see what caused this strange bulge. After dissecting and removing away as little bone as possible, they finally found some evidence. A tooth. One that must have been lodged in the jaw for many years from some freak accident, was found lodged inside the bone. And with this tooth, they could find out who this victim was, and who they were with at the time of their death. The name of the victim is one I will not say, of course, but the presence of his tooth was all the police needed to find out that Felix Boldiar 
was the last man the victim was with, and thus was found guilty on all charges. Barry finished his story there, and to be honest, I do not blame him. I could now clearly see why the police had such a visceral reaction to me when I asked about the cleaner. They must have reawakened memories they were desperately trying to get rid of, like I was reopening a horrid gash that was so close to healing without even knowing. I owe all of my friends in the police department an apology. I didn't know, or expected a twisted story like that. Barry downed the last of his coffee and stood up to return to work. But before he left, he handed me a small yellow piece of paper that had a roughly written phone number on it. He told me that if I wasn't satisfied with his story, then this number should give me some more answers. With a quick nod and thanks for the coffee, he left me at the small table, numbed and frozen from what I just heard. I sat there for longer than I am willing to admit, for my brain felt fuzzy trying to comprehend what the crime scene to the cleaner would have looked like. Despite Barry's descriptive storytelling, a scene where no mess, not even a fallen over vase, was completely alien to me. It just didn't make sense at all. How could someone have been that efficient at covering his tracks? He would have had to have very intense knowledge on human anatomy if he was able to neatly divide a body into its three main components. When I look back at myself now, I wish that my naturally high curiosity was satisfied right then and there. But it seemed like whenever a question was answered, two more came out to take its place, like some sadistic hydra who was egging me on with crumbs of information. I wanted to know more. Once I got back to my senses, I found a payphone, inserted a quarter, and dialed the number on the piece of paper Barry had given me. The phone rang, and after a few words in silence, someone picked up. I introduced myself as formally as I could and was cut off, the recipient telling me that he was in fact expecting a man of my description to call him. When I asked him who he was, he instead gave me an address that he told me to write down. I scrambled for my notebook and took the coordinates down as ordered. Once I had it, I attempted to make conversation again, but the caller, instead of embracing my offer, immediately hung up, leaving me alone inside the payphone with only the address as my next lead. After a day's work with my patient, I got into my car and drove towards the place the caller had told me to go. It turned out that his place was in South Tardiac, a brutally savage place where open sewer lines melded with the other horrid smells that hung in the toxic air. With the smells burning my nostrils, I found the house as fast as I could, and after finding it, swiftly walked up the footpath and knocked on the door. It flung open almost immediately, allowing me to see a man who looked to be in his mid-twenties to early thirties. His eyes were sunken and his back was hunched, messy hair and straggly beard covering his face that looked scarred from many bar fights. He looked me up and down and told me to come inside, getting out of my way as I walked in. He was in the middle of making himself some coffee, so he ordered me to sit on the couch and wait until he was ready. I must say that I pity the people in downtown Tardiac. Their houses were anything but comfortable living spaces. From the broken tables, covered windows, open candlelight, and holes in the floor, it was no wonder why only the ones of no family or background find themselves settling down in such a place. I sat on the mold-eaten couch waiting for my host to get his coffee, and a few minutes later, he appeared and sat on the small table opposite me, eyeing me with eyes that looked like he'd seen many things, despite being rather young. The man introduced himself to be Felix's younger brother. Once again, I will not say his name for respect of his privacy, in addition to how much he was able to tell me about Felix, and what his childhood was like. What I learned was something I never thought in a million years would come from a fellow like Felix, given his 
future endeavors. At first, I always thought of Felix as being a child that was very clean and organized, but it turns out that that wasn't the case, not even a little bit. On the contrary, Felix was a child who absolutely loved being dirty. There was a time in his life where his brother recalled as a time where he was rarely seen clean. His brother told me some stories of the many dirt-infused hijinxes he and Felix got themselves into when they were children, including some which even involved the open sewer line South Tardiac was infamous for. One of these stories that threw my mind for a loop was one where Felix, as a dare, dived headfirst into an infested part of the sewer, to the horror of his brother. But, instead of coming out sick and disgusted, or dead, he rose from the sewer and had the biggest beaming smile on his face, laughing as he was covered in sewage water and years-old feces, a dead rat stuck to his dense clump of hair. Whether it was a small bit of grime or being covered head to toe in mud, Felix was a child who looked like he came from underground instead of his mother. He was a very filthy, but very happy child. I guess when I really think about it, it isn't too surprising to imagine Felix as being a dirty fellow, especially given how all his life he was born and raised in this part of Tardiac. Anyone born clean or self-respecting wouldn't have survived even a few years here. In the South, you have two options. Adapt to your surroundings, or don't. It was clear which choice Felix ended up making, and thus, survived in downtown Tardiac, living the best life he could. After hearing all of these small and charming stories of childhood innocence, my curiosity was at an all-time high once again. I now had to find out what changed. What could have possibly happened to Felix during his childhood that caused a boy who used to love dirt more than his own skin to turn into a terrifying monster who left his victims in piles and sanitizing his crime scenes to utter perfection. His brother unfortunately wasn't fully around when Felix became like this, but he had a very good idea on who was responsible. Their grandmother, who passed away around 10 years ago. When Felix was only 14, both of his parents passed away from cholera, no doubt because of the dirty water supply and being the generation that wasn't raised in downtown Tardiac. With the parents gone, the boys had to take up the mantle in taking care of their grandmother, who was alone thanks to her husband's death a few years ago. With the parents now gone and out of the way, their grandmother would go on to make both of the boys' lives a living hell. To say that the grandmother was an animal would have been the understatement of the century. She was an absolute slob who had no control over her actions, from constant drooling to even relieving herself during eating. She would never clean herself up either. She'd never brush her hair, she'd never wash her hands, she'd never even clean the dirt from under her fingernails. She just lay there, wallowing in her own filth, just waiting for the boys to clean her up. On particularly bad days, she would release more dirt and other fluids while the boys were in the middle of cleaning her up. She would repeat this repulsive lifestyle until she died of old age, five years after the death of Felix's parents. For Felix and his brother, their lives went from imaginative and grand to a life that was always filled with daily dirt, daily fumes, daily disgust, and daily torture. From the way his brother described the stories to me, the image of Felix's grandmother that took form in my head was not that of a person like you and I. All I saw in my mind was an animal. A thing just regurgitating and relieving itself of all kinds of horrid fluids, devoid of awareness or care for where or what the fluids splattered themselves on. 
I felt pity for the boys who had their childhoods and adolescence lost to this vile hag of a woman. It was no wonder why Felix grew a burning hatred towards Dirsch, for who could be insane enough to handle such depravity of humankind on a day-to-day -day basis without developing a trauma or disgust? While his brother hated the lifestyle, he told me that Felix was the one who got the full brunt of it all. Because he was the older brother, Felix felt as though he had a responsibility to do the vilest work on his grandmother so that his brother wouldn't have to experience it. He would tell his brother to move aside so that he could have full control over the situation and thus knew exactly what to clean up. The number of times he must have cleaned that disgusting pig alone must have been in the hundreds, even thousands. I could imagine that every time he had to clean up her mess, his old love for dirt turned more and more into soul-boiling contempt. He was never the same again, even after the death of the old hag. Something changed, or rather snapped in his mind, and from that day on, he would become something that his child self would have gagged at. Felix developed an obsessive passion for cleaning. Despite his hellish surroundings, it didn't stop him from attempting to scrub the grime off his life and his home. He was seen by his brother cleaning the whole house every day, cursing under his breath at the sight of all the dirt contained in the small shack. He washed far more than what was necessary, about four to five times a day for up to thirty minutes each. Another thing that he developed an obsession for was human anatomy and biology. On the rare occasions when he didn't clean, he could be found reading a textbook or a study on the human body in the living room, snuggled up on the couch with a mug of hot water by his side. He would do this for about three hours a day, and then, once he was satisfied, he would go right back to cleaning. This cleaning process got so insanely obsessive that it started affecting his eating and sleeping habits, as he would spend all day and all night just cleaning and hacking away at the soot, the mud, and the grime that caked the house, without pausing at all. The only thing he consumed was water, and he did it in copious amounts, causing his stomach to be bloated. Whenever his brother attempted to stop him, Felix became violent and unhinged, bellowing at him to clean after himself, or he would be kicked from the house and left in an open sewer to rot. After hearing that, it was no wonder why his brother stayed in line. But the house wouldn't be the only thing Felix would clean, however. One night around the winter season, his brother heard cries of pain coming from the bathroom, and... Once he immediately noticed the cries were coming from Felix, he rushed in to see what happened, and froze at the ghastly sight. Felix was covered in cuts, on his legs, his face, and his arms, which now had no visible hair. Even his eyebrows were shaved off. He was completely bald on his scalp, having cut away the long hair he had for years, and his fingers and toes were covered in blood, the ends of them now sanded away, and the fingernails ripped out and were now lying on the floor. He was holding a razor to his eyelashes, and had a horrid expression across his face as the blade glided clumsily across into his eyelids. It was a look of insane satisfaction. A hellish form of relief. He was free of anything on his body catching dirt. He was as clean as humanly possible. He chuckled to himself as his brother looked on, screaming in horror at the sight of his older brother's transition into madness. Suffice to say, the child Felix Baldiar was never coming back. Felix was now a new man, or monster. 
A couple of days after this horrid transformation, his brother left the house and moved into the one the two of us were sitting in now in order to live out the rest of his days in peace. He hasn't seen Felix since. He never cleaned anything after that, for cleaning brought back too many traumatizing memories of his grandmother along with his brother. Anything that was too dirty to use, he just threw out, or burned. I can't say that I blame him for that. When I asked him on what he thought of his brother becoming a serial murderer, he had an expression of painful confusion, like there was a massive bit of cognitive dissonance being performed in his mind. He was perplexed as to why Felix would kill anyone, for the act of killing someone would just leave an awful mess. Knowing that I probably stepped too far into the poor man's personal life and reopening old wounds, I thanked him for the visit and told him that I was satisfied with what he told me. As I stood up to leave, his brother said that if I wanted to know anything else about Felix, my next destination would be to go to Tardiac Hospital. He was reminded of all the times his brother would tell him about how he was going to make it in his studies in human biology, and a person would take him under his wing. A man named Frank Schmidt. I had enough at this point. What I had was a perfectly good story with a completely understandable ending. I had a tale of childhood innocence being corrupted by horrible circumstances that turned a bright young boy into a cleaning obsessed psychopath. So why? that when I got into my car to leave the broken shack in the south, did I drive straight to Tardiac Hospital. I reached the hospital after about 30 minutes of driving on an empty road. Once I parked my car, I managed to make my way inside, where I went straight from my new office to dial a number. My main office is outside of Tardiac, they just gave me a new one for a couple of days, just so that I can keep my eye on my patient. I had all the people from the hospital in one of my notebooks, and after some quick searching, I found the number of Frank Schmidt. He picked up the moment the phone started ringing, and asked who it was. When I told him my identity and what I wanted from him, he went silent for a moment. He asked me if I was the therapist helping out the new prisoner recover from his time in Tardiac Prison. When I told him yes, the phone hung up. Within five minutes, there was a knock on my door, and I opened to find Frank Schmidt standing there with a stern look. He told me to let him inside and to close and lock the door behind me, for he wanted no one to disturb our conversation. Apparently, he was curious as to what I wanted to know about Felix Baldiar. About the cleaner. I asked him if he knew anything about his time in Tardiac Hospital when Felix was there, if he got a job here, and what have you. Frank smiled and explained that Felix was a very gifted young fellow. He had a genius-level understanding of human biology and anatomy at the age of just 25, and came into the hospital seeking work as a cleaner. After seeing him read many textbooks and studies during his breaks, Frank took Felix under his wing, seeing a great potential in the strange fellow, and taught him about the human body himself, in exchange for Felix cleaning up his surgeries and other medical messes. Felix very happily agreed to the proposition, and for the next few years, Felix and Frank would grow to be quite a good team. Frank would teach and study the bodies he dissected to Felix, and Felix, after learning from an expert in his field, would go and wash away and clean any bloodstains or fluids that came from the body's dissection, making them clean enough so that they could be preserved in the morgue and studied further if needs be. While Felix was working in Tardiac Hospital, Frank noticed that he started to grow an interest towards the morgue, and specifically, the mortician, whose job is to basically make sure the bodies are clean and that all equipment is clean and sterile. Frank proposed that considering Felix was so good at cleaning up his mess, he could help the mortician in cleaning and sterilizing the bodies, so that she wouldn't have to do so much work. 
Felix was ecstatic to show Frank what he was made of, and within a few days, he was assigned as the mortician's assistant. But it seemed that Felix was almost too good at his job, and would always criticize the mortician for the lack of care she put into cleaning the deceased. He would try and do everything himself, from the removal and cleaning of clothes to the extraction of the fluids that needed to be drained from the bodies. He became so controlling over the matter that he soon became the dominant mortician, taking every body that came in to himself so that he could clean and sterilize them without being bothered. The mortician of course complained about Felix's controlling behavior, but the hospital saw his sublime work and instead encouraged him to keep going on with his methods. The lady quit her job shortly after that polar opposite reaction to her grievances. Felix didn't really make any friends during his time in the hospital. Everyone found his hairless appearance to be very unnerving and thus never spoke with him. But everybody couldn't deny that he was the perfect man for the job of cleaning dead bodies. Despite his oddities, Felix sounded like he had a good life inside the hospital. He seemed to be doing very well for himself, considering where he came from. Frank himself had a deep respect for the fellow, telling me that he was very disappointed when during a time Felix was absent for a few days, he sent Frank a letter telling him that he was not going to return to work. He did not give a reason, though he told Frank that it wasn't anything personal or that he was being mistreated by members of staff. He simply just wanted to move on with his life and try new things with his talents and knowledge he learned under Frank Schmidt. I asked him when he got this sudden letter, and Frank told me that it was on March 23rd. March 23rd. The day the first victim was killed. When I informed Frank on what also happened on that day, he seemed a little confused. When I asked him why he was looking at me with such confusion, he told me that he knew of that old woman, for she was a patient of his who he told was going to die in a couple of days. If his analysis was correct, and it always was, Frank's predicted date of the old woman's death, a death that would have been of just old age, would have been on the 21st of March, two days earlier than the day she was found. Frank had some work to do, and had to cut our meeting short. He went out of my room with a quick nod and told me that the next place I should look, if I wanted anything else on Felix, would be with my own patient. Maybe I could get the real truth out of him. And with that, he thanked me for my time and closed the door, leaving me alone in my office and my thoughts, which were now so scrambled and confused that it caused me a slight headache. How is it possible that the old woman Felix killed was in fact already dead two days before Felix was even there? Is it possible that he killed her two days before the deranged phone call was made? It couldn't have been because the place was far too clean when the police arrived. According to them, the pile looked only hours old. Two days would have left a small layer of dust behind. When I thought harder about the situation, a thought started to gain form. One that was in the back of my subconscious ever since I talked to his brother but didn't want to think was real. It just sounds way too odd, and makes it seem like Felix wasn't actually as bad as the police were making him out to be. Could it be possible that out of all of the bodies found in the style of the cleaner, Felix didn't actually kill a single one? I had one final person that I could get information out of. My patient. I had to wait a few days since our appointment was already scheduled, and calling him out of nowhere would have been very unwise. So, I just waited until that day arrived. The thought of Felix being innocent all along becoming stronger and stronger as time went on. Three days later, my patient arrived. As I was chatting to him about his daily life outside prison and going back to a state of normality, 
The urge to ask him was becoming almost unbearable. As he was telling me about his time in a cafe on a cold Tuesday afternoon, I suddenly blurted out and asked him about his time with Felix in Tardiac Prison. There was a long and uncomfortable pause. I could tell I crossed a line there, for his face gave me a look of pure terror, as if I just asked him about an affair he was having that I knew all along. He almost looked like he was going to hit me. I tried to apologize for my breach of privacy, but my patience stopped me midway. From his expression, he was trying his best to avoid doing anything rash, and took a deep breath, like the ones I taught him to do whenever he was going through intense stress. He looked me dead on, with piercing eyes, as if he was staring into my soul instead of me. He had a stare that reminded me of the times I helped old veterans get over their trauma at war while I was working outside Tardiac. Then, he spoke. His voice was dry and gravelly, and he didn't change his tone at all. He sounded like he was in deep concentration, like he was trying to find the perfect word to describe his traumatic experience with every syllable. The story he told me would be one that I will never forget, for it gave me the answer to my most dreaded question. My patient was sent to Tardiac Prison on the 15th of April and was assigned to live in the cell with Felix. The prison was full of all kinds of criminals, from killers to rapists, yet despite the brutality and savagery of the inmates, they all had one thing in common, a fear towards the cleaner. My patient, of course, didn't know about the strange commonality amongst the inmates for the first few days he was inside, but even despite not knowing, he always knew that Felix was a little off, for when he went into his cell for the first time, he found the entire space to be completely spotless, as if it was never touched. He saw Felix in the corner of the cell, lying still with a dazed expression as a sponge was clutched in one of his hands. My patient told me that when he saw Felix for the first time, he initially thought he was dead from the way his body was contorted, and it was only when Felix jilted awake and introduced himself did he realize that he was indeed still alive. That strange introduction would be the tamest thing my patient would experience during his time in Tardiac prison. Things would only get more strange and disturbing as time went on. Felix was not really one for chat. He was usually far too busy cleaning the cell or himself to make any time for small talk. But that didn't stop his new cellmate from trying to converse with him nonetheless. My patient told me that Felix was indeed a strange fellow to talk to. Every answer he gave to his questions would be a simple one or two word answer with little to no elaboration. He made casual conversation difficult. That was until my patient asked him how we got there. Felix's attitude completely changed. Instead of his usual quiet and contained self, he swung around and told his story in great bursts of theatrics and wonder, as if he was waiting for someone to listen to him for many years. He told my patients the story of his childhood, his time caring for his grandmother, his new passion for cleaning, the removal of his hair, the disgust towards his brother, his wonderful time cleaning the dead bodies in the hospital, and his admiration of Frank Schmidt. He then went on to tell his cellmate that he gained a deep respect for the cleanliness of morticians and felt pity for those who had to clean up the bodies of disgusting old pigs who died of old age. It was a few days before the death of his first victim did he decide that he was going to do something about it. So he told my patient a story of him going to Northeast Tardiac, disguising himself as a caretaker for the elderly, and found an old woman who was said to pass away in a couple of days, according to a conversation he had with Frank a few weeks before he departed. He took great care of the old woman in every aspect, making her food, chatting idly with her, cleaning up after meals, and said that he held her hand on the night she passed away, as the old age finally caught up to her. With her death, he could finally get to work, 
and cleaned her body to utter perfection. He found the whole experience fulfilling and said that he couldn't stop there. So, after he left the house spick and span for the next person to find her, Felix went on to find more old people he overheard were dying soon all over Tardiac and took care of them during their final days. He made it his mission that once their souls left this planet, he would make sure that the mortician would have to do no work cleaning up their filth. I was completely silent when I heard this story. Even now, I cannot find the words that can best describe the utter disgust and otherworldly terror I feel towards Felix's actions. The fact that he went around looking for dying people and took great care of them as he waited for them to die like a soaring vulture, only to completely wipe them off the face of the planet once they were gone, in order to make a mortician's job easier. It wasn't evil. It wasn't justified. It wasn't even explainable. It was just complete insanity. Felix wasn't actually a monster. He didn't harm a single person during his crusade. He was just absolutely deranged. Needless to say, my patient did not talk to him after that tale and left him to clean the cell in peace while he feared for his life. My patient would then experience what it was like to live a daily routine with this lunatic. Every morning he would wake up to the sounds of scrubbing as Felix cleaned the same spot of the cell he cleaned the day before, cursing under his breath at the sight of dirt. When breakfast, lunch, and dinner came around, Felix never ate solid foods, but drank only water and other liquids, which my patient found out later to be his food. The reason for this according to the inmates was because Felix grew a reputation of hating solid foods so much that he became violent whenever he was given it. He said that the solid food would make his feces solid, something he hated with a burning passion. Because of this, he refused to eat for many days and caused a lot of fights. The guards had to resort to blending his food before they served it to him just so that he could consume something without any fuss. By doing this, his violent outbursts completely subsided. But after seeing what his violent nature could do, his fellow inmates and soon his own cellmate avoided him like the plague for they were all too afraid to get close to him. As a result of all of this, Felix always ate alone. During activities, Felix would always just be in the corner shaving his hair while the other prisoners did their thing. He was only really active when black market started circling around, where he would only ask for new razors and cleaning products. Because of his unhinged personality and weird appearance, Felix would never have to pay for his items, as the other prisoners were too scared to demand anything from him, and simply wanted him as far away from them as possible. At times, he would even try to offer his traitor some goods, but he was always shooed away. Even the guards wouldn't confiscate his belongings because Felix never did anything criminal with them. He just always used them for their intended purpose, and when they attempted to before, his violent tendencies became too much of a hassle. Nobody was fond of this hairless, pot-bellied man whose violence was barely rivaled, and yet despite that, had this weirdly alien politeness when he was left alone. However, that alien politeness would vanish when he would return to his cell and had to use the bathroom. If his feces were by some chance solid, Felix would make everyone in the prison know, 
as he would start bellowing and roaring with a satanic rage that not even the most violent prisoner showed. No inmate ever saw Felix use the bathroom, so when they heard the furious screams, they all thought he was going through a manic episode. They even showed concern towards my patient when he moved in, asking if the cleaner ever did anything to him during the times of his screaming. My patient didn't have the guts to tell them that the reality was far more comedic. During the evenings, Felix would just keep cleaning the cell with his sponge and other cleaning products. The police had long since left him alone to his own devices. Much to my patient's disturbance, and would even ask him if he could do some small chores like tidy his bed or scrub the bars. Fearing for what might happen to him if he said no, my patient complied with his demands without any resistance. Even if some of them involved removing his own hair. When nightfall eventually came, Felix would never sleep in his bed, but sleep in the corner of the room, keeping his eyes open so that he could clean any dirt that would build up while he was off guard. This lack of sleep got so bad that on some nights, guards would have to come into the cell and sedate him just so that his body could rest. For my patient, this routine was just far too weird and far too off to not be disturbed by his cellmate. My patient then told me the story that caused the cleaner to be so feared by everyone in the prison. One time during lunch, a tattoo artist was going around and marking different prisoners using a device he made out of his personal belongings. Nobody fought back against him, for he was a goliath of a man. At seven feet tall, covered in tattoos, one being an iconic symbol of a bull on his forehead, and being built like a tank, fighting against him would have been a death sentence. His nickname, in respect to his great size, was The Mountain. The Mountain found Felix sitting by himself, with his bare head exposed, cleaning his own plate with some bleach and a cloth that he managed to get from another prisoner. The Mountain walked over to him, and placed the device on his head. The instant the needle touched Felix's head, chaos ensued. Felix whipped around with great speed, and with his left hand, doused the mountain's face with the bleach, splashing him square in the eyes. As the mountain roared in agony, Felix tackled him to the ground, and with his cloth, covered it in more bleach, and began violently scrubbing at the mountain's face. The mountain was wailing in pain as Felix rubbed at his face harder and harder, until suddenly, Felix stopped and jumped off the mountain in an instant, his mood changing from blind rage to complete apathy in less than a second. The guards jumped in to separate the two, and when analyzing the damage, found that in addition to the mountain now being completely blind, his iconic head tattoo had been completely scrubbed away, leaving a deep, raw gash in its place, which was bleeding profusely. According to stories from his inmates, the reason Felix stopped so suddenly was because he found the blood too dirty to clean up, and thus lost interest. The weirdest part about all of this fear towards the cleaner was that when you take a step back and see the bigger picture, Felix wasn't really a threatening person. Every time he became violent, it was because something had provoked him. He never once started any fights himself, only finished them. But that wasn't what his fellow inmates thought. They all saw him as a bomb that could go off at any second, so they all kept their distance making sure to stay out of his way whenever he was around, and especially when he was cleaning. My patient lived in this perpetual state of fear for the next couple of weeks, until one night, it all boiled over. As he was trying to get some sleep, his mind was plagued with nightmares of the cleaner and the horrid ways he disposed of the bodies. And after waking up in a cold sweat, he turned to the window 
and screamed. There, in the moonlight, he saw Felix Baldiar standing bolt upright in the middle of the room, staring out the window, breathing very slowly, as if he was asleep, cleaning his face with his signature sponge. The guards had to put my patient on sedatives, he was screaming so much. He was in a state of astronomical panic, the stress so high that his heart began to give out. His screams, he told me, were so loud that they reverberated on the walls and throughout the prison itself. He went mad for just a few moments. If it wasn't for the sedatives, my patient feared that he wouldn't have recovered as easily as he had. What scared him the most, however, was that while he was going through his manic episode inside his cell, Felix didn't move an inch from his spot. He didn't even react to his cellmate's sudden screaming. He just stayed there, watching the window. The last thing my patient remembered before the sedatives kicked in was that while he was drifting off into uncontrollable sleep, he swears that he saw Felix turning his head towards him, showing massive black pupils in his eyes, and a small, but clear, smile. I now had everything. Every answer to every question I had was given to me in great detail, leaving nothing open to interpretation. I thanked my patient for opening up to me, and said our session was over. In reality, we still had a few hours, but I didn't think either of us could bear it any longer. He left without a fuss and closed the door, leaving me once again alone in my office, my thoughts being the only thing that kept me company. I curse my curiosity for being so strong. I curse my imagination for being so vivid, for now I only see the horrifying images that stuck out to me as I learned of Felix's life. I see the young boy coming out of an infested pipe with an innocent smile. I see the grandmother who caused the boy to snap. I see the boy cleaning his house as a man with such determination that his hands began to bleed. I see the boy in the hospital admiring the dead bodies. I see his first victim being dissected and drained of all fluids in life. But the image I see the most is Felix standing in a clean cell, staring out the window as his skin and head refracted the moonlight, his large and expanded pupils showing no reflection as he pulls the destroyed sponge around his body. Another time. As I sat there with these images plaguing my mind, I hadn't noticed a small piece of paper that had landed on the floor. I guess it isn't that big of a deal. After all, what's wrong with a little bit of a mess? And that shall do for today's recording. I hope that you enjoyed your time listening to these three tales, and I hope you stick around for future audio recordings and more videos in the future. Content will be up in due time, and I hope to see you there. But for now, thank you for listening, and I shall see you in the next one.